So, praise the Lord. We're glad to have you here today, and we're going to be uh, looking at Thanksgiving. Obviously, we're going to go to Psalm 100, one of my favorite psalms. It is a psalm that my wife and I have memorized, and our children were one of the first portions of Scripture our children memorized, and they could all say it when they were probably before they went to school, they all had memorized Psalm 100. It's an easy psalm to remember, but it is an enormous amount of substance in it. And the title here today is Giving Thanks is the Foundation of All Genuine Worship. No one who worships God can do so without being thanks, giving thanks. We, it, uh, As we learned this morning in Sunday school, and what is ours in Christ uh, the promises that are ours in Christ. There's, should no one ever have to be uh, wondering, well, what should I be thankful for today? We have a tendency to be to think in the realms of, you know, I have this, I have this, I have this, I have this. But they're nothing compared to what is ours in eternity. What is ours in the, in the gift of salvation? What is ours in our relationship with God? All of these things that we so often take for granted to be able to even pray, let alone expect answers to prayer. All of these are, are wonderful truths. So the commandments of the uh, the commandments here of the hundredth Psalm should reflect the innermost reality, the heart of every truly born child of God. And we shouldn't have to manufacture this. It should be there, it should be part of who we are. We should live our lives, I think, in humble adoration and gratefulness for the love of God that shows to us when he reached into this sewer of decadence that we call humanity to rescue us from an eminent destiny of eternal damnation. Why would God do that? Why would God touch us? Why would God have anything to do with us? Well, I guarantee you it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with God. <laughs> Every verb in Psalm 100 is an imperative. Write that down uh, by that psalm somewhere. Every verb in the, in the whole psalm is an imperative. What's an imperative? Abel, what's an imperative? Good boy. It's a command. So Psalm 100 is a statement that flows from a real faith in God. Psalm 100 is a testimonial statement to the reality of our understanding of who God is and what he has done to redeem us. We ought not to have any problem saying we have a wonderful God. Or to be able to say God is good. If there is no desire to obey him from the heart, the spirit of the psalm as a, rea as a reality of our lives, our lives are missing something that should be a critical part of every true believer's life, which is real faith expressed in constant worship, praise, adoration. Otherwise, we shouldn't have to manufacture this stuff. It ought to flow from us like if we were cut, we would bleed. The spirit of this psalm, I think, reflects a genuine spirit of worship. And the spirit of this psalm reflects a heartfelt attitude of praise and thankfulness to God. It's there. It just oozes out of every pore. <laughs> Praising God and being thankful should be natural out outcomes of genuine faith. If we know it, if we know these truths, there's no reason to be walking around looking like we just ate sour grapes. We ought to have uh, just that joy in our heart. And just the very thought of these things ought to put a smile on our face. Ought to put a skip in our step. Ought to, ought to create a hallelujah and praise the Lord attitude of everyday life. It ought to be there. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll read this psalm. Oh, Father God, as we open your word and read this wonderful psalm that you've given us, these commandments that you have given to us in this text, 
Lord, we apologize that you have to command us to do what ought to come naturally. And we pray, Father, today that you help each one of us grasp these wonderful truths of who you are and what you've done and, and the relationship that we have with you. We pray today that you help each person understand them, comprehend them, and come out of that with prayer, rejoicing, and adoration. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 100, five verses of scripture. Not very lengthy psalm. I think you could very readily memorize this uh, in a matter of a few, few minutes, certainly in a few hours, you can memorize this psalm, and I encourage you to do so. But notice it is a psalm of what? It's a psalm of praise. Praise is something that comes from us. Praise isn't something that we manufacture. Praise is natural. It's normal. It's just, it, it's there. And when we open our mouths, praise comes out. When we talk about God, it should be a, out of an attitude and spirit of praise and worship and adoration and thankfulness. But it starts off with this introduction. It's a psalm of praise. <clears throat> and it says, make a joyful noise. That's the first verb. Make. We're commanded to do that. We're commanded to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. The second verb is serve. We're commanded to do that. The Lord, how? With gladness. I've asked somebody one time, I said, uh, are you Christian? I said, yeah. I said, are you happy about it? I said, yeah. I said, well, maybe you should have your uh, heart communicate that with your mouth because you just look like you, ate, you sucked on a lemon. Now, why is it that Christians have no joy? Have, they cannot serve the Lord with gladness. No, the, the Bible says we're to make a joyful noise. That doesn't mean it has to always be in perfect harmony. <laughs> Sometimes what comes forth from our lips has got nothing to do with our ability. It's just that it is what? Unto the Lord. You think God really cares if you can carry a note? <laughs> we do, because it's painful, but God doesn't. <laughs> Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with what? We're singing. Why do we sing songs and hymns in church? Because we're commanded to. We're, we're to come before his presence with singing. Now, do you think the, the singing ought to be uh, with gladness and, with, and joy? We should be. And then it says what? Know ye. Know. It's the next verb. Know. We're commanded. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. And then it goes on and it explains that a little bit more to us. Why should we be thankful? Why should we worship? Because know ye that the, the Lord Jehovah, his God, it is he that hath made us. Not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. <laughs> now he, he's talking about the assembly of the of of believers, he says, enter into his gates. Whose gates? His gates. Did you think about that when you were coming into church today that you were earning into his gates? You're coming into the presence of God. He, he promised where two or three are gathered together in his midst, there you'll be in the midst. Did you think about the fact that you were going to be entering into the presence of God in a very special, unique way? Not just in the common way of every day, but now in a special way assigned primarily to be thankful and to worship and praise and adore God. To learn of him. 
Enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving. It ought to be natural for us. Why does God have to command it? And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Bless his name. Don't you think this psalm would be a good psalm to read on the way to church or when you get up in the morning before you come to church on Sunday morning to remind us of why and what we are doing? The point is it's all about God. Not much about us. We've made it completely the opposite. We've made it all about us and very little about God. Be thankful unto him. Bless his name. Years ago, I, I learned this little simple truth. I'd spent my whole life wanting, doing anything I could to be blessed to God. And then a little light came on. And I said, that's all wrong. And from that point forward in my life, I thought, I'm going to try to do everything I can to be a blessing to God. And it changes your perspective completely. Yeah? The blessing of God still come to you. But the focus is no longer selfish. Bless his name. For. Now what's the word for mean? Because. For. Because the Lord is good. The Lord is good all the time. Why should we obey all of these commands? Why? Because the Lord is good. Because, this colon there, or semicolon there, so it's continuing that same four, because his mercy is everlasting. And, continuing that same four, because his truth endureth to all generations. It's never going to erode. It's never going to change. So our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, Patty and I this last uh, week have had two new great-grandchildren have born into the world. We'll probably never see them in our lifetime. <laughs> but we have two new great-grandchildren. Beautiful babies. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy warns all believers about the end times. And there he, he, he warns how unbelief will manifest itself in individual lives in the last days prior to the second coming of Christ. Not just in the world, but within the church as well, because the epistle is written to, it's a, it's a pastoral epistle, and he's talking about what's going to happen within Christianity in the last days, just prior to the second coming of Jesus. Among the, the list of grievous sins to God is the sin of being unthankful. Look at chapter 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also, otherwise, besides what he's already talked about in chapter 1 and chapter 2, this know also, that in the last days, that's just prior to the second coming of Christ, when the Christ calls the church out of the world with the trump, perilous times will come. That's dangerous times. What's going to make them dangerous? For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Narcissism will reign. If there is one characteristic of Generation Z, it's narcissism. It's all about me. And out of that selfishness, out of that narcissism comes covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, tra traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form 
a kind of godliness. That's a Christianity in which we see developing all around us right now. It's all about me. The name it and claim it prosperity gospel of our generation. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. What are you supposed to do? Turn away from that. Saying thank you, thank, thank you is not equal to being thankful. <laughs> you, ever, you ever have a, you know, the kid, somebody says, here, now here's a piece of, here's a sucker from you from the doctor, and he gives you, gives your child a sucker, and you say what? You say to the child, now say thank you. Child says, thank you. <laughs> Saying thank you is not the same as being thanked. A child that's really thankful, he runs up to the doctor, gives him a big hug, and says, thank you so much. It's a big difference. We cannot read the words of Psalm 100 without a sure understanding that the Lord, whom the psalm directs our praise and thanksgiving, was real to the psalmist in every way. And those who listened to the psalm and did what it said from the heart revealed a real and personal relationship with the Lord. And so when these commandments came, they said, well, wow, why does God have to command me to do these things? These are, these are what I want to do. These are, these are part of my everyday life. I, I can't wait to, to be with the Lord this day and, and to be used of him and to talk with him and to read his word and, and to maybe be a witness for him today. I can't wait for that. I live in anticipation of what God is going to do today. Not in fear and dread. <laughs> Being thankful is a heart issue. Flows naturally, normally, effortlessly, like blood through our veins from understanding who God is and what he's done and is doing. Why do we have to trump it all up? Why, did the, why is the church, the so-called church of the last days that we just described, why is it trying to manufacture all of this stuff? You don't come to the church to get that stuff. You bring that to the church with you when you come. It isn't the singing of the songs that gives you this experience that makes you feel like you've just had a, an, an accounting with God. No, you bring that with you when you come. That's real. It's got to be manufactured. That's pretense. Well, I just love that exciting preaching where the Preacher gets all excited and spits all, all over the, everybody in the front row. Maybe runs up and down the aisles and, and, and gets everybody excited. Why aren't you excited when you come? I get excited just thinking about my wife uh, cooking me some of her um, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. You know, I don't have to get excited when I get them. I'm, I'm excited just thinking about them. They're, oh, they're good. They're good all the time. <laughs> Why don't we bring that to church with us when we come? A real relationship with God is not one of endless obligations lived in pretension. A real relationship with the Lord is a source of joyful, exuberant celebration that floods Believer's life. It is a fountain of life that comes from us. It overflows. When you are filled with the Spirit of God, it is always filled to overflowing. And when we have not generated real knowledge of God that results in real faith in God, the lives of our children will be described more by 2 Timothy 3 1 through 5 than Psalm 100. It's unfortunate. Very few Christians rise to the heights of the worship reflected in Psalm 100. Why? I think the words of this psalm reflect an attitude of thankfulness and praise that translate the person truly believing in the God of the Bible into a thanks-living, God-praising, soul-winning celebration of life. It is a joy to be around the kind of person who life 
whose life exudes Psalm 100. I, I love to be around those people. I love to be at pastor's conferences where, you know, the guys sit around and talk all day, just talk about the Lord all day long. To listen to women uh, who talk about what God's doing with them in their churches and how God is blessing and using them. To hear the testimonies of what God's doing. Oh, that's exciting. But I bring my own excitement to it. The difficulty is we get discouraged. Why? We get discouraged because God's not doing what we think he should be doing. <laughs> I laugh at that because it's so foolish. God is always doing what we think he should be doing. But he doesn't overrule. He doesn't overrule, or never overrides the free will of man. And we live in the day, the days of Noah, when men's hearts are hardening to the things of God. And unfortunately, we get discouraged by that. Instead, we ought to be rejoicing in what God is doing in our own lives, and, and we ought to be a testimony to the to the living grace of God that lives within us. And maybe they could see something in us that says, well, you know, they live a little differently. They're not discouraged. They're not defeated. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, but they're not discouraged. They can go into the life full of joy and rejoicing and praise and adoration and worship. What have they got that I don't have? A knowledge of the real God. Everything that this kind of Christianity says and does translates into, the, into, the, into a praise the Lord testimony. We don't have to say praise the Lord every time we have something good. Our, our lives are that testimony. That there is a fountain of joy and enthusiasm for life that springs from that soul. It's real. Nothing seems to be able to damper their joy and enthusiasm because of the source of these emotions is sweet and precious, a relationship with their Heavenly Father that's able to transcend any problem that the world throws at them. No matter how tough life gets, no matter how bo our bodies become wrecked with pain and, and uh, the accumulation of death as we approach that end time, we can go into it with joy and rejoicing. The world and its adversaries may be able to knock them down occasionally, but they'll be back on their feet in a few hours or days with a new smile on their face, and they're going to be praising the Lord. Why? I got knocked down? No, I got up again. This describes a person with real faith in the real God of real Bible. Real faith is joyous. Real faith is thankful. Real faith is evident in the lives of those who generally understand the relationship that God offers. But a relationship has always at least two sides to it. God brings everything he is to the table. How much of you do you bring to the table? We all may occasionally allow the cares of this world, the troubles, the trials, the pressures of life, difficulties, failures, our own, to steal away from us the joys of knowing the Lord Jesus and the joys of serving him. However, Psalm 100 is one of those psalms of the way things ought to be. David was such a man. His own lust got himself in big trouble with God. And he cries out to God, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When the attitude of, of Psalm 100 is a natural, it's the unforced, it's the unpretentious attitude flowing from in-depth knowledge of who God is, what God has done, and what God is doing in our lives, there will be a righteous exhibition of a life lived in celebration of that relationship. This is the true spirit of worship that eradicates the humdrum and the droll of our under-the-sun existence and translates life 
into a moment by moment firework, celebrate and praise and glory to God. If you haven't had any fireworks, perhaps you better set a fire in your heart. Because everything that's necessary for those fireworks is already there. But everybody's got to bring their own fire. If your Christian life has become mundane, it's because your focus has been misdirected to the mundane things of life. Refocus. Learn what it means to worship God and, and you will learn what it means to celebrate life. Worship that is not a celebration of praise to God is, is, is a, rap, a warped distortion of what real worship should be and a warped distortion of what real Christianity is all about. And the world out there in pretense is all trying to manufacture all of this that ought to be in our hearts already. Let's make our music louder. Let's step the tempo up. Let's have some flashing lights and strobe lights. And Let's issue the church with dancing shoes as they come in the door. It all comes from right here. When it's real. But when it's not real, you got to manufacture it. Psalm 100, 1 and 2 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Did you think about those two verses of scripture before you came to church this morning? The words make a joyful noise are, uh, noise are from the Hebrew word uh, ruah. It means to shout out in rejoicing. Like people that are giving a stand, standing ovation and applause for a great performance. You know, you, you, you're sitting in a crowd and someone plays a, a tremendous uh, classical hymn and, and pretty soon there's a few people over here and a few people over there that, that stand up and they give a standing ovation and pretty soon the whole audience is on their feet but there were only a few that really felt it, really were moved by it, that now moved the rest of them. Be the few. Be the few. The idea is that of an impulsive shout out of joyful exuberation that cannot be restrained Neither can a true joyful noise be manufactured. A true joyful noise burst forth from a heart that is illuminated by the Holy Spirit of God and uh, uh, motivated by the Holy Spirit of God. And it is the Spirit of God within it that is actually crying out with our body. Galatians 5.22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. What's the next one? Joy, suffering long, the idea is suffering under trials and difficulties, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, there's no limit or restriction. It's a damn burst. When the filling of the spirit of happens, all of these things come forth. A true joyful noise is spontaneous. But it is spontaneous rejoicing. It is spontaneous rejoicing that overflows from a heart filled, already filled with the joy of the Lord. The word joy in Galatians 5.22, Greek word kara, kara it's, it refers to a course or, or occasion for joyous celebration. We can blame no one but ourselves if we allow anything or anyone to rob us of the joy of our salvation and the joy of living in intimate fellowship with the creator of the, of the universe. This kind of relationship with God will not happen by accident in anyone's life. 
and it must be cultivated, it must be exemplified in every facet of our existence. It must be something we do on purpose. We must plan for it. We must think about it. Galatians 4, 6 says, and because ye are sons. What? what? Now look at here. Because ye are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Crying. Abba, Father, Daddy. It is the most intimate word we could have for God. His spirit is in our heart. Because ye are sons. Already, because you are already the children of God. God has sent forth his spirit. The spirit of his son. The Lord Jesus. His spirit into your heart. Crying, Abba, Father. What is the spirit of God doing? He's crying, Abba, Father. Why don't we hear it? Because he's doing it in our heart with the intent that it will come forth through our tongue. That's a filling of the spirit in Galatians 5.22. Wherefore, verse 7, thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We're joint areas with Christ. Is that not something to be thankful for? <laughs> Why do we have to get all worked up about something that ought to be already there? <laughs> wow. <laughs> he is a fool who allows anything to interrupt this intimate fellowship with his heavenly father. That is already here through the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 7. Once a Christian has experienced this joy, he'll never be satisfied with anything else. This ride that the world calls, this carnival ride that the world calls life. Although it may provide us with pleasures for a season. Is nothing compared to the joy that comes from our relationship with the Lord. The excitement of getting up every day and just wondering what's God going to do today? What? What? Witness will I be able to give to the, to the glory of God today. So this kind of joy will only be experienced by Christians who habitually live fully surrendered to God's will. And if, if you have this kind of joy in your life, it's not going to be a burden to be in Sunday school. Or not going to be a burden to be in preaching services. Somebody said, well, preacher, you preach too long. I said, you don't pray long enough. If you prayed a little longer, you'd say, well, preacher, you don't preach long enough. You will long for any opportunity or vehicle to truly lift your voice and praise to God and make a joyful noise. You'll be standing in anticipation every day expecting what to, right now, maybe this next moment is when I'm going to be able to make a joyful noise under the Lord. Again, real faith. Like this is evident in a person's life. Ministry is another vehicle to express praise and appreciation of the God of our salvation. And if you're not trying and thinking about ministry, then maybe you've lost your way. Serve the Lord with gladness, Psalm 100, verse 2. Serve the Lord with how? With gladness. Nothing will wear you out faster than trying to force a smile on your faith when there is no smile in your heart. That was an amen, Marilyn. <laughs> that was a pretty good timing on that anyway. <laughs> Nothing's going to wear you out faster than trying to force a smile on your face when there's no smile in your heart. It's unfortunate that this is so normal today. It's accepted as normal. There's, there, there's no, nothing harder, more unpleasant task than the task of doing something you hate to do. 
The oil of gladness and thanksgiving can, can lubricate almost any impossible task. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. If you're striving for excellence, uh, it doesn't make any difference that you're not appreciated in life. I've worked for employers that didn't appreciate how hard I worked and what I did. We're always complaining that they had to pay me too much. Uh, well, they didn't always. I didn't, live, I didn't live, work for them for, that, for very long if that was their attitude. But uh, uh, that can make a, a working for someone very difficult. But they, they, they would, you know, that whole spirit that can be changed immediately if you say, well, I don't work for them, I work for the Lord. I'm not doing this for them. I'm doing this primarily for the Lord. Why do you work so hard? I had a man ask me. Do you do twice as much as we do? That was a union guy. <laughs> I said, well, I don't work for him. I work for the Lord. My, my job is to do the best I can. When you truly love someone, doing things which normally you will not find joyful suddenly become miraculously pleasant. If you know those things bring joy to the person you love. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves about this. The central reason why doing what God commands is a burden. A burden to us is because we do not really love him the way we should. Now people don't like to hear that. But why is reading your Bible a difficulty because you don't love the Lord the way you should. Why is getting up on time to be able to be in church services a big burden? Well, because you don't love the Lord the way you should. Why is witnessing uh, something that we dread? Well, because you don't love the Lord the way you should. And we could go on and we could go on and we could go on and we could go on, but the point is we don't love the Lord the way we should. None of us do. 1 John 5, 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Statement of fact. Then it has an end. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. My first focus in life is not to love you. My first focus in life is to love the Lord. And if I love the Lord, I will love you. And I won't compromise the truth to do it. For this is the love of God. Here it is. What is it? Here's, here's how we describe it. That we keep his commandments and his commandments aren't grievous. They aren't a big burden. That's what it means to love the Lord. We'll keep his commandments. And they aren't grievous. What does that mean? They'll be joyful. They'll be joyful to do that. We'll never learn to serve the Lord with gladness until we get the joy of our salvation out of our heads and into our hearts. And sometimes I think uh, Christians think Psalm 101 says, make a doleful noise unto the Lord. What is the source of this wellspring of joy and gladness? What, what is the source of this spark of life that jumpstarts our hearts every day to sing praises to God? What is it? Psalm 100 verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us. And not we ourselves. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. What does that mean to me? I've got a shepherd. That will leave the 99 and come find me if I stray. The psalmist says he will put me upon his shoulders. And carry me back to the flock. And the word of God says that. Heavens himself rejoice over one sinner that repents. The source of all genuine praise and worship and thanksgiving is an intimate personal relation 
relational knowledge of God. Not just a head knowledge, a relational knowledge of God. The source of this joy and gladness is knowing the Lord as a personal friend, as a father, as a companion in all circumstances of life who never leaves us or forsakes us. The source of this joy and gladness is knowing this one who knows everything there is to know about you and who continues to love you anyway. You are never going to come to God with anything where he says, well, I didn't know that. There's nothing about your life that surprises him. And though it may grieve him, he already knows about it. In fact, that's what the word confess means. It's a Greek word, homilageo. It means to agree with. All you're doing when you confess is coming to God is you are telling God and you are agreeing with God what he already knows. People everywhere are seeking joy and gladness in every avenue of life except the one avenue of life that can provide it. There is no joy or gladness in this life apart from knowing the Lord and loving him. Ecclesiastes 2.10, the whole book of Ecclesiastes is that substance of that. Solomon, King Solomon, who is pursuing all of these things to get this earthly joy. He says, whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. <laughs> I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of my, all my labor. Then I looked on the, all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that, my, that I had labored to do. Otherwise, I had gone to the place where I could have anything I wanted. Anything I wanted, I could have it. If I wanted to get a Lamborghini, I could get it. If I wanted mansions, I had it. If I wanted cattle on a thousand hills, I had them. And after getting them all, his conclusion is, behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. I didn't get anything from any of this. It was all empty. Go grab yourself a handful of gold dust. And when you're thirsty, see if it does anything for you. If you're hungry, see if it'll satisfy. Oh, you say, well, I could take it and buy. Yeah, you could. But in and of itself, it's worthless. It won't satisfy your thirst. It won't fill your hunger. But a right and real relationship with God will do that. He says, I will give you water that you'll never thirst again. I will give you food that you'll never hunger again. If your life and your Christianity do not overflow with joy and gladness, and it's not a celebration of praise, perhaps you've lost your focus. Perhaps you do not know the God of the Bible the way you think you know him. If worship and serving the Lord are a burden to you, perhaps you need to seriously re-examine the intimacy of the professed relationship you say you have with the Lord. If coming to church service is a burden to you, you'll never give God the worship he deserves. Because you bring a burden with you. You don't bring worship with you. You bring regret. Regret, I could have used this time for something else. I'm going to bring worship with you. If obedience to God's will and faithfulness to serving uh, him is forced labor for you, the problem is that your relationship with God is forced and pretentious. If you won't do what God asks you to do out of grace, something that you would do for a, for a, for a dollar or for $10 or for $20 or $50, you've missed the point. If I were to say, okay, we want to start canvassing our city, 
And uh, I will give you $5 for every piece of literature that you hand out. I would imagine there'd be a lot of people that would come and do that. But I would say, if your heart is right, God will reward you in heaven for that. How many would you give out the same amount of zeal and earnestness for it? If a person does not want to spend time with the Lord, he's deceiving himself about the reality of his faith and the reality of his love for God. Do not love someone if you do not want to spend time with him or if you do not want to increase intimacy with him. I got fired over that. I worked at a gas station. I worked a night shift. And I'd get off at 7 o'clock in the morning and my wife would come. This was before we got married. I was still a pagan. And at 7 o'clock she'd pick me up and we'd spend all day long together. I was excited about seeing her every morning. It was such a wonderful time. We spent all day long together. I wouldn't go to sleep. And I did that for about four days, and finally one night, I fell asleep behind the cash register. <laughs> and somebody had put some money there, but he had also told my boss. And he came and met me at 7 o'clock, and he said, we won't be needing you anymore. See, I don't love my job, I just, I just needed to have it to pay the bill. Psalm 5, verse 11 says, But let all those that put their trust in thee, what? Rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy. Because thou defendest them, let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. <laughs> if these are the realities, you don't have to be pretentious about it. It's going to be natural. Psalm 107, verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks under the Lord for or because he is good for because his mercy endureth forever let the redeemed of the Lord what say so the redeemed of the Lord ought to say God's good the redeemed of the Lord ought to be vocally and verbally thankful the redeemed of the Lord ought to Say, his mercy endureth forever. Because they're a living testimony to it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Why is it you have nothing to thank God for? <laughs> we do that around the table on Thanksgiving. We say, well, let's, everyone gives something that they're thankful for. And, uh, it's amazing after the first or two, first two or three people, we've run out of things to be thankful for. <laughs> I would say, well, where do you want me to start? When do you want me to end? Because that's a long sermon. I thought about preaching on that today, all the things I'm thankful. But we are scheduled to have dinner before noon. Friends, I, I, I'm just trying to say to you today, this psalm ought to be natural for us. That'll be something that is as normal to us as breathing and bleeding and all the other natural functions of our body. It ought to just be normal. Tells us how far we've fallen, isn't it? How depraved we really are in ourselves. None of this is important to many people because they're just not saved. That's the first reason. They're just not saved. So get saved today. That's where it all starts. Repent, believe, confess, call, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Be born again. And let that spirit of the Son dwell in your hearts. Our Father, as we close this time together, Lord, we pray for each soul here, including my own. 
So often, Lord, we get caught up in the mundanes of life and forget the glories of our future. That we're just sojourners here and we're on a journey to glory. Help us to live like it. Help us to live each day with our destiny in sight. And praise you and thank you for all that you've done and are doing. In Jesus' name, amen.